welcome to the lecture video for chapter 16. I don't have any relevant things in my house to show you for this because it's about communities. It's not about individual organisms. But I told you all about um, an insect collection piece I have um, that I would show you. So I will show you it here on the video now. Um, in 2006, I took an immersion course trip to Egypt that was cross-listed as biology and art. And so for my final project for the course, when we got back, um, I pinned and displayed some insect specimens I found dead in the sand there. Um, okay, I will show you them to you now. So, well, the wasp is kind of spinning around, but there is a honeybee and a wasp and then two flies that I found dead. When we were in Egypt and then when I got back I used a I went to a rare books library in Cincinnati and I used a uh, Napoleonic era text to identify um, all these insects it was like a 1700 text illustrating insects found in Egypt during a I guess like an expedition that Napoleon ordered anyway and then I like kind of adorned the box with hieroglyphs that included insects so if you look at the box, there's like beetle hieroglyphs on this side, and then there's fly hieroglyphs here on this side that I drew and put on the box. Oh, nothing on the back. And then this one has grasshopper hieroglyphs. And then, of course, I saved for the front bee hieroglyphs. It was really cool to see um, hieroglyphs about Egyptian beekeeping when we went there. Um, anyway, let's get to it. Let's talk about community structure. Look at this beautiful picture of a coral reef. Uh, in today's lecture, we're going to talk about uh, how to measure species diversity in communities, and then we're also going to talk about the three-dimensional structure of communities. We're going to talk about dominance, keystone species, all that kind of stuff. Some of which you learned about in Gen Bio, some of which you have not. Um, first, let's talk about how you measure species composition. You guys are actually going to use some um, statistics in lab, specifically alpha, beta, and gamma diversity to look at species diversity in insects in the communities that we studied this semester. Um, these are some other um, values and uh, calculations that ecologists use to measure and quantify diversity. Um, I'm not going to ask you to calculate any of these on the next exam, but I will expect you to be able to interpret any values that you are given um, on the exam. So let's go through some of these important statistics for measuring species composition. One of the most basic parameters that's usually measured in communities uh, is relative abundance. Um, and this is an integral component of a lot of uh, calculations for measuring species diversity. Um, so it's just for an individual species, how many are there out of the total number? Um, and rank abundance diagrams are often used to look at species composition as well. In the next slide, I'm going to go through how a rank abundance diagram is made and what kind of information you can get out of it. But here's an example of one right here. Um, ecologists also measure species richness, which is just the count of the species occurring in the community. It's just the total number of species that you find in a community. They also measure, measure evenness. So evenness is going to be um, a measure quantifying the the equitability in the distribution of individuals among the species. So are there a whole bunch of one species and just a few of other species, or is there an even distribution of individuals across all the species that are present? That kind of thing. We'll go into a little more detail in a couple slides. So let's talk about a rank abundance diagram. Um, rank abundance diagrams can be really informative for telling you about dominance in the community which is whether or not you have a whole bunch of one species and very little of others. This is a graph ranking, showing rank abundance in these two communities that are represented, this one and this one, stand one and stand two. And basically what you do is you 
identify all your species, all your what like you did with your plants in ecology. You count the number of individuals, just like you did in ecology. But then the next step is that you rank them. So what you do is you count them all up, and then you rank them from the species that has the most individuals in that community to the species that has the least number of individuals in the community. So the species that gets the rank of one is the one that has the most individuals. So for stand one, this is yellow poplar, and it actually also happens to be the same species for stand two. Um, this is one important thing to think about when you're looking at rank abundance diagrams is that if it's mapping two separate communities, each value is not always going to represent the exact same species for each line. So what you can actually see is that number two, the species that ranks as number two is different for each stand. So this dot here, oh no wait, this dot here is white oak for stand one, but this dot here is actually, oh they don't have this, they have this one ordered but not this one. This, okay, this dot is, oh, sassafras. So these dots are not both ranked two because they're the same species, they're ranked number two because they're the second most common species in that plot. So like I said, rank number two would be white oak for stand one and it would be sassafras for stand two. And then you follow that. If you have ties, so like each of these both have 12, uh, each of these both have one, they will be tied and you just assign them a random next number in the group. So this would just be like one, two, three, four, five. And the, whoever the scientist was just randomly picked whether or not which one was going to be four and which one was going to be five. Um, and what you can see in this graph is you, get, you can get a lot of information from comparing these. What you can see first off is that stand one is much more diverse than stand two because it has a lot more species, so it has a lot more rank abundance numbers. You can also see that there's um, a little more even distribution in the species there too. Now, if a, a, if a community is more even in the number of species present, it's going to have a less strongly sloping curve. If there's a lot of unevenness in the community where one species like yellow poplar tends to dominate, then you're going to see a steep curve in the rank abundance diagram. So make sure that you read through the textbook and make sure that you are able to interpret rank abundance diagram graphs for the exam. Um, here's some other uh, indices and values for measuring species diversity. Again, I'm not going to have you calculate these on the exam, but I do want you to be able to interpret them. This is some data actually that um, ecology students calculated um, the very first semester that I taught ecology. Um, and I, these first three I'm going to go through just so you can see where the values are coming from for these next ones, but these ones in bold are the ones I really care about you being able to interpret for the exam. So um, Simpson's index of D is just the sum of uh, the relative abundance squared. Simpson's index of diversity is basically, because this number is not uh, intuitive, so low numbers represent high diversity, a lot of people use Simpson's index of diversity, not Simpson's index, um, 1 minus D, because it's just more intuitive to think about the number that way. Um, there's also Simpson's recipro reciprocal index, which is 1 divided by D, just another variation on the theme with Simpson's reciprocal index, 1 equals the community containing only one species. Um, but the values I really want you to be able to interpret on the exam if you're presented with data are for evenness, the shannon Wiener Index, and species evenness. So with evenness, um, which you can see calculated here, um, 1 is a value of complete evenness. So anything less than 1 represents um, a less than even community. So what you can see here is like you've got highly even communities 
here. Well, there's only two species, so I guess there's not like a ton of diversity to begin with, but there must be very similar numbers of both of those species. So that would be a higher evenness value. Lower one would be these 0.6 ones. One is when you have equal numbers of every species in the community. There's also the Shannon Wiener index. Um, for this value, I, again, I don't need you to be able to calculate it, but for the Shannon Wiener index, zero is only equals only one species present. Um, so if you have values greater than zero, you have more than one species present. You can see that here, there's only two species present, so that they have lower values. Um, you can also see the highest values for the Shannon Wiener index occur in the communities that have something like 12 species um, or 14. Um, and then for species evenness, um, if you have a value, if I'm presenting you with a value of H max on the exam, um, well, at least when you do the calculations for this H max in this calculation is when all species are present in equal numbers. So um, it's just a variation on evenness. So mostly what I want you to be able to interpret is evenness in the Shannon Wiener index when presented with those values on the exam. Now let's talk about dominance. I've already brought up that word a little bit. Um, dominance is when a single or a few species are going to predominate within a community. Um, a lot of times ecologists use the Simpsons index as like a proxy for measuring dominance, but dominance is always going to be relative to the system that you're looking at. Um, just because, you know, popular or dominant in one system doesn't mean they're always going to be the dominant species in every environment that they occur in. Um, or even like within another plot, there might be a different dominant species. Um, but high abundance of an individual species doesn't always equal the most dominant. So you can use Simpson's index, which measures individual species and counts them up, or you can measure it by biomass. So I have this picture here um, as an illustration of where dominance can, just to show understory and trees. So you can, so maybe you have like a bunch of small saplings, um, but different large canopy trees. So maybe you could have a community where there are the biomass of the small saplings on the forest floor actually outweighs the biomass of whatever species are in the tree canopies just by sheer number of saplings that occur on the bottom. So you could have something um, like that happening. Or you could even have the inverse where you don't have a lot of trees but the, out, the biomass of the trees outweighs the biomass of the saplings that are on the forest floor, something like that. Keystone species is a really important concept when you're studying community ecology, and hopefully this is refresher from when you took gem bio. Um, a keystone species is a species that has a disproportionate impact on the community relative to its abundance in that community. So. These are not necessarily the most dominant species in the environment. They may have very few numbers, but they greatly impact the diversity of species that are present in the community with their presence. Um, one example of a keystone species is elephants. And elephants can really influence the community structure of the savanna habitats they live in purely by their grazing and browsing behavior on trees. So what they do is they feed on trees and they decrease the tree canopy and by decreasing the tree canopy they open up that area for grasses in this graph that you can see here um, that below tree canopies when the percent tree cover is decreased by elephants eating it you see an increase in grass biomass so when elephants are not feeding on the tree canopy there's a lower grass biomass you can also see that there's actually just a general increase in the abundance of large herbivores when elephants are browsing on trees in the savanna. So um, with decreased numbers of trees because elephants are eating them, you also see larger herbivore abundance because the herbivores are feeding on the increased biomass of grasses. So the elephants have functioned as keystone species by influencing the grass and then also the other large herbivores that feed on the grass.
Another keystone, typical keystone species, is uh, sharks. Sharks, and also the the word comes from keystone, which hopefully you all living well. If you live in Pennsylvania, most of the time you should know what a keystone is. It's a piece that holds together um, a structural piece in an arch, usually like this piece that it's showing here. Um, they're really important for the structural integrity of buildings and other things. Shark are apex predators. They feed on uh, cow nose rays. The cow nose rays feed on um, krill and crabs and clams and other stuff. Um, and then the bivalve and arthropod populations um, have stability through that interaction. But without that, you get build the the key when the keystone's gone it breaks down the structural integrity of the community um the cow nose rays increase their numbers in the population and then their prey go almost entirely uh extinct because the numbers of the cow nose rays are not being controlled by the keystone predator um here's some other keystone species um one is a wolf um, you're going to watch a video about how important wolves are in Yellowstone for the next lecture, I think. Uh, otters, which we'll talk about in a second, are important keystone species as well. Um, so think a little bit about what other organisms you think are imp impacted directly or indirectly by the presence of these two species in the environment. And what would happen if they were eliminated? Think about all these species that might be influenced by a wolf in the environment. It's not only going to be their prey items but also the food of the prey that they're feeding upon, right? Now we're going to talk about the otter here. So, um, sea otters feed on sea urchins in the environments that they live on. Sea urchins feed on kelp forests, and sea otters help manage kelp forests and other organisms associated with kelp forests forest by feeding on the sea urchin populations and keeping um, those populations low enough that they don't decimate the kelp. Now in the 1990s, there was an increase in predation of sea otters um, in coastal environments um, by killer whales. And there was an increase in the 1990s. So the killer whales were introduced. They started reducing the sea otter populations with that reduction in sea otters, there's an explosion in sea urchin populations and then a subsequent decrease in kelp forests because of these killer whales. So what you can see in these graphs, this is just a graph of um, sea otter abundance at different localities. Um, they probably were just, just started measuring. This is some really cool long-term data that they have for this site, but you can see that they were really high in the early 90s and then with uh, increased predation by killer whales, you see a really precipitous decline in all the populations of the sea otters. In graph B here, um, this is uh, some data looking at the biomass of sea urchins in, in an environment. Um, pretty low, pre-90s, pre-killer whale predation increase. Post killer whale increase, you see a huge boom in sea urchin biomass because the sea otters aren't around to eat all of them anymore. Um, in graph C, um, this is looking at grazing intensity on kelp forests by sea urchins. Pretty low percentage of loss of kelp pre predation intensity by killer whales. Post 1990s, they've basically, in 24 hours, they've lost almost 50% of kelp biomass because of sea urchins. Um, and then this is just looking at total kelp density, um, pre-killer whale predation, really high, very low afterwards. So, keystone species. Um, food webs are also really important for understanding community ecology and community structure as well. Um, first, let's differentiate between a food chain and a food web. Um, a food chain is just an abstract representation of feeding relationships within a community. So this is just like a one-to-one -one graph of like, this animal eats this, then this animal eats that, then this animal eats that. 
In contrast, you can also have food webs, which are highly interwoven networks, so it's not just a one-to-one -one species relationship. In food webs, you can have basal species. That would be, um, in this community, it would be the grasses that are being fed upon. You can have intermediate species, so that would be anything eating the grass, and then anything... Uh, yeah, mostly in this graph, it's just the things that are eating the grass. So the prairie vole, ground squirrel, pocket gopher, and then you can have top predators. So actually, oh, this one would be an intermediate species too because it's not at the top. So anything that has only arrows pointing to it and not away from it isn't getting eaten. So weasels, um, badgers, marsh hawks, coyotes, those would be the top predators in this system. Um, and the maximum number of links in a food web is going to be a direct function of the number of the species richness. So the more species you have, the more connections you're going to have in the community, um, and the more species you have. Pretty simple. I already said that. <laughs> okay, so um, here's a representation of a food chain. This is just one-to-one. -one. Locust eats the maize. It's like old lady who swallowed a, fi a fly is like food chain. So snake eats a lizard, lizard eats a locust, locust eats a corn. Uh, here's a more intricate representation of another food web um, with and without trout. Um, so uh, this is some kind of fish called a bully. It looks cute. And then so the um, basal species in this would be uh, any kind of detritus and algae that are being fed on. The intermediate species would be the caddisfly, mayfly, and then the top predator for this one would be bully, and this one it would be the trout because uh, the bully then becomes an intermediate species when trout are introduced. Um, and then this is just another picture of a way to represent a food web. So it's got all the species around the outside, um, and then it's got all the connections on the inside. Um, and you can see that in, sometimes in a food web you can have multiple connections between multiple species, you actually see it in these two. You can also um, take examine community ecology using functional type classifications. Um, functional type is a group of species that share a common response to the environment, so life history characteristics or role within the community. So um, this is just grouping things by what they do or the purpose that they serve within the community. So um, here's an example of a food web. Let's think about some functional type classifications that you might be able to find in here. So one way you could possibly group things in here is by whether or not they're photosynthetic or not. So uh, those, no, those are zooplankton. So this stuff's photosynthetic. Some of this stuff might be photosynthetic. This stuff definitely is photosynthetic, so you could do photosynthetic, non-photosynthetic. Um, another way you could do that in like a terrestrial environment would be by shade tolerance of each of the species. Um, you can do it by like iteroparous versus semiparous. Do they reproduce once? Do they reproduce more than once? Um, here you could group them by like whale, non-whale, because there's a lot of whales. In this system, um, you could group them by like phylogenetic classification. So like you could group them by uh, invertebrate versus non-invertebrate. Uh, birds versus non-birds. So just like grouping them by their 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 phylogenetic position, life history characteristics, what they do in the community, um, that kind of thing. And what it, what's really important about functional type classification is, is that it allows ecologists to simplify really complex communities into units that allow them to actually study um, and ask basic questions about what's influencing the structure of community. So this is like a very complicated food web and if you group them by functional types, it might allow you to simplify and look at the factors at play in structuring that community. So, um, 
let's talk about the physical structure of communities. Let's talk first about terrestrial communities. So terrestrial communities are generally defined by the vegetation they have. So is it a tall tree? Is it a short grass? Uh, is it an evergreen or is it deciduous? Um, is it brush type? Does it, is it woody? Um, you can classify them by shrubs, trees, herbs, um, different types of evergreens, moss, lichens. These are different ways that you can classify the physical structure of a community. Um, aquatic communities are generally defined again. So like for the physical structure of communities are generally not defined by the animals that live there, rather the plants, because the plants can't move after they become like the full grown versions of themselves. Um, so communities generally are defined by their plants rather than the animals. So that's why we're talking mostly about plant structure here. And then aquatic communities, the same rule. Um, it's defined mostly by the sessile photosynthetic organisms that occur. Um, so you can define them by like, is it a kelp forest? Is it a seagrass meadow? Uh, coral reefs, although they are not, uh, they're animals, they're not plants, they can photosynthesize and for the most part they're sessile. So coral reefs can form the basic structural physical characteristic that defines a community. And then um, with aquatic communities, you, you can also be defined by the abiotic condition. So like water depth because of light penetration is going to determine the types of organisms that live there. So is their flow rate and their salinity, which you don't see so much in terrestrial communities using these abiotic factors. Um, we're talking about terrestrial communities, depending on the height of that community. So like you wouldn't do this in prairies, but mostly in forests, you generally see um, like a distinct structure in three dimensions. So you can have a canopy layer which is where you have the, the primary site of fixation for photosynthesis because it's getting the most light access. Um, if that canopy is open and is allowing a lot of light in, you can also have a, a more developed understory like in this picture here. Um, you can also have an herb layer and that what grows in the herb layer is gonna depend on soil moisture, nutrition, how dense the canopy is, how dense the understory is. So if this is a really dense understory and a dense canopy, you're gonna have only really shade tolerant species growing in the herb layer. And then below the herb layer, you got the forest floor where lots of stuff is going on too. So um, you have microbial organisms that are feeding on whatever falls from the canopy in the understory and the herbs. Um, it's the primary site of decomp. So you get these four, sometimes only three, sometimes there isn't a really well-developed understory if the canopy open, can, if the canopy is not more open. Um, so you have four, sometimes three layers of terrestrial forest communities. Now in aquatic environments, you can have, you generally have a photic layer. This is a the layer in the aquatic community where light can penetrate and then there's going to be some depth where light no longer really penetrates um, and so you're going to have a lack of photosynthetic organisms but they're still going to be fed by decaying matter that's falling into the aphotic layer. A lot of organisms can move between the photic and aphotic layer as well. So you're going to have the photic layer, the aphotic layer, and then you're going to have the stuff that lives on the very bottom in the sediment. Those are the three like distinct uh, stratifying layers that you have in aquatic environments. Um, you can also have this thermal stratification due to the access of light. So um, we've talked about this before. I can't remember which lecture early on. We have the epilimnion. You get a decrease uh, in light penetration in the metalimnion, which is going to change the temperature, and then you have the hypolimnion, which is cold and very low light availability. There's also this um, concept of zonation in um, clinal communities. So specifically, we're talking about intertidal zones and um, change in altitudinal 
changes in altitude. Um, so zonation, the definition for zonation is changes in the physical and biological structures of communities as one moves across the landscape. So as you're moving in geographic space. Um, here's a graph looking at zonation, um, low tide versus high tide regions um, in an intertidal area. These are kind of the, these, and it's all based on um, sun exposure and salinity exposure via how long during the day you're actually covered by water. And so that's gonna create these distinct zones and stratifications along the shore and the animal and plant communities that live in them. So like, oh, if you were an invert zoo, you should remember what an olive snail is because you had to identify that seashell. Um, but you have like these strictly aquatic things in the, in the um, uh, areas that are never exposed. Um, in areas that are, are exposed during the day, um, particularly when you start to hit low tide, um, you have things that burrow into the sediment, different types of bristle worms and clams and stuff like that, mole crabs, which are really cool. Um, and then you have this stuff that lives right at the edge of high tide, so it's never submerged in water. You get my favorite. Tiger beetles live on the sandy shores of uh, beaches and also... Um, like saline areas, but also on the shores of rivers. This is Cicindella sexcatata, my favorite tiger beetle species. Um, you can get some crabs and then amphipods and then like the salt marsh grasses that never get um, completely submerged in the salt water. And then you can also have zonation in altitude, so in different plant communities that are gonna occur at different elevations based on temperature, barometric pressure, uh, Things like that. Oh, I just thought of a really cool example of zonation in places I've done field work. So in Mexico and Central America, you see really distinct zonation occurring by elevation in um, the plant communities, and they're generally termed ecoregions. So at lower elevations in Mexico and Central America, you typically get like pine oak forest. And then as you move up, um, you start to get um, like colder adapted trees and stuff. And then you have into the cloud forest, which is the higher elevation, you get um, more, um, you can get like more like almost rainforest type areas because of the high amounts of precipitation. Um, that's why they're called cloud, Mon yeah, there it is, montane rainforest. Um, oh, I guess they only have it here. This is like super, super high elevation. Uh, Oh, you, I have never, I think I, the highest I got when I was doing field work in Mesoamerica was like here, 2,800. <laughs> There's not, no mountains that are really that higher than that. Uh, but yeah, I at least saw this kind of zonation. And it was actually really cool. In some places that I was doing field work, I could look down the hill of where I was standing and see like pine and oak forest. And then I could look up the hill and see a completely distinct plant community. Like sometimes it can be that distinct. It's really cool. Um, but sometimes it's really not so easy to see that distinct line, um, and ecologists have to think about how different two adjacent areas have to be before we actually call them separate communities. So here's just some examples. Um, this is a very complex community on a hillside where you see, like, they're separated by, um, water availability based on slopes, so wetter and drier but also you see di distinct communities by elevation. So there's like this synergistic interaction between water availability and elevation that creates all these, this mosaic pattern of um, forest types in this hillside. Um, you can also see this in like the eco region that we have designated in Pennsylvania. Um, I've seen maps of I think level three eco regions are even more defined than this. So there are different ways that you can define community boundaries. Now, let's talk a little bit about some theory in ecology and two contrasting views that um, are present when you're studying community ecology. So you have um, Frederick Clemick's concept, uh, organismic concept of community, and then you have Gleason's individualistic continuum concept.
So with the Clements organismic concept, species belonging to a community are really closely associated with each other. So the key important part of the organismic concept is coevolution. And so in this idea, all species are very closely associated with each other. And so the ecological limits of that community are going to be coincident with the distribution of the, the individuals that have this close link. And so in this organismic concept, because these species have highly co-evolved with each other, you're going to have distinct, distinct units with distinct boundaries. Um, so this is kind of what you see in the, or this is what you would expect to see in the organismic concept of a community where you have like clumps with a bunch of species overlapping and they're co-overlapping a whole bunch because they've co-evolved a lot with each other. And you might see a few species that have broad distributions, but generally you see clumps because of co-evolutionary relationships. Now, on the other hand, you can have the individualistic concept. So, um, this is the idea that abundance of population species changes along environmental gradients um, individually, but not, th there's, with the individualistic concept, you're not saying that species don't co-evolve, but you're saying that the abiotic factors of an environment are gonna more strongly influence a species distribution rather than the co-evolutionary relationships between the species. And so they're each gonna have their own individual, mostly separate distributions based on the environmental gradient. So you can have distinct clumpy like communities a little bit, but you can also just have like a continuum of different species. So you see like a little bit of clumping, but mostly it's just each individual species has its own optimum based on mostly on the environmental gradient, not based on relationships between species. So the main difference is that here, the relationship between species is really important and a very strong factor in forming communities. This one, environmental gradient is more important to each individual species. And you're gonna see more, you can have continuums or discrete communities, but what's most, the strongest influencing factor is the environmental gradient. So that's a major difference. Make sure that you understand these two concepts. Uh, so of course, read about everything in the textbook, but especially this because you'll need to be able to explain the difference between them and what the two concepts are on the exam. Uh, oh, this is a little short, short kind of lecture. The next two are gonna be kind of short. I don't wanna overload you with a bunch of information right before you take the exam. So, um, that's it. Tune in next time for chapter 17. Bye-bye.